Greetings, my name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to online worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So as we begin worship, uh, I want to invite you to extend the gift of worship to others. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can go down and click share. I don't think Facebook is doing watch parties anymore, but if you click share, you can share worship uh, to your page on Facebook. Uh, if you're on YouTube or on our, one of our other platforms, uh, copy the link out of your browser and share it with someone. I've noticed uh, quite a few shares uh, in the last couple of weeks, and I appreciate you doing that, and what a, what a great opportunity to bless others with the gift of worship. So today we're uh, wrapping up our In God We Trust series. Uh, we're going to share spiritual communion together, make our generosity commitments to God, and hear a tip from Paul about how we can be a part of making thanksgiving overflow to God. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, Jesus prayed that we might be one in spirit, one in mission, one in union and communion with each other and with you. So on this Communion Sunday, give us eyes to recognize your reflection in the eyes of others. Give us a heart big enough to give of ourselves to share your love with people everywhere. Lord, pour your spirit out upon us in this time of worship. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I invite you to join in our opening hymn. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today's reading is from 2 Corinthians. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food 
will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by your generosity of sharing with them and with all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given to you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Paul's second letter to the church of Corinth, or as we know, 2 Corinthians, is written prior to a visit he's about to make to the church in Corinth. And he's visiting them for a variety of reasons. One, just to to pay them a visit, to, to go and check in on them, to offer them encouragement and instruction. He also has some friends there and companions in Christ that he longs to see. And he also tells them that he's coming to collect an offering to bring with him in support of the church in Jerusalem. So he's going to go to Corinth, uh, visit, visit with his uh, Christian brothers and sisters, collect an offering that they've been taking up, and then he's going to take that offering with him to, to Jerusalem. But why Jerusalem? Why should one community of Christians take up an offering and send it to another community of Christians some 800 miles away? I mean, can't the Jerusalem church raise their own money? See, the importance of Jerusalem to the Jesus movement can't be overstated. Uh, Jerusalem is the heart, really, of the Jewish faith, right? The, the, the home of the temple, a temple where Jesus worshipped, a temple that he visited as a child, uh, a temple where he often taught. Jerusalem is also where the disciples shared the Last Supper with Jesus. It's where Jesus was crucified. It's where he rose again. Jerusalem is where Jesus ascended into heaven. It's where the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost. And in many ways, Jerusalem was sort of the launching pad for the Christian movement all over the world. Uh, Jerusalem, you might say, was the mother ship or the headquarters of the Christian movement. And the leaders in Jerusalem, there were people like Peter, people like James, the brother of Jesus, they were the leaders of the church. And so recognizing all of this and honoring all of this, Paul asks the churches that he's planted around the Roman world to support the saints in Jerusalem financially. Again, this is sort of a recognition of the importance of Jerusalem and honoring uh, the fact that they were the starting place of it all. So Paul tells the church in Corinth that when, when it comes to this offering, they should sow abundantly that they might reap abundantly. He tells them to give cheerfully and not reluctantly or under compulsion. He says, I'm not trying to twist your arm here. Uh, He he reminds them not to worry about not having enough and that God will provide for them abundantly. But what I want us to focus on out of of the reading that we uh, heard this morning is what Paul says in verses 11 and 12. And so let's hear those two verses again. Paul says this, You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. So listen to this again. We're going to take up this offering. He says, but this offering will not only supply the needs of the saints, not only supply the needs of the people in Jerusalem, but it will overflow with many thanksgivings to God. Now, what do you think Paul means by that? So for those of you who uh, do social media, I'm I'm pretty active on Facebook. You know that social media is both a curse and a blessing, Right? I think uh, the blessing for me of social media comes from connecting with old friends. It comes from connecting, uh, keeping up with people's lives. Well, one person that I've reconnected with uh, on Facebook is a guy named Phil Lewis. Phil was one of the youth leaders at the church that I grew up in 
in New Jersey. And I have lots of really fond memories of Phil. Uh, Phil led youth lessons. He took us out for pizza. Uh, Phil could remember the year of any song that came on the radio. We used to have fun kind of quizzing him. We'd say, all right, Phil, when? And he would get it every single time. Uh, and this was before the internet. Before, I mean, he just, he, he knew things. Uh, most importantly of all, though, Phil's love for Jesus and his love for the church was contagious. And Phil was one of the people who influenced my life and my decision to make Jesus my Lord and to serve the church. So Phil and I lost contact, you know, probably for about 20, maybe even 25 years. But when we reconnected on Facebook in 2009, Phil told me how happy it made him to see what I had done with my life and, and, the, and the ministry that I was doing and the lives that I was, I was touching. Uh, but here's the thing. Every person that I've ever talked to about Jesus, in some ways every sermon I've given, every Bible study I've taught, every mission trip I've gone on, every person I've prayed with, all of it, every, every single thing that has come out of my ministry, um, Phil Lewis has a part of it, right? Because he was a part of sort of planting that seed in me that got all of this started. Uh, here's another thing. I've been a part of helping other people answer a call to ministry, uh, you know, both within the church and in, and in like, pe- clergy people. Uh, and in some ways, I'm a part of every person that they've talked to about Jesus, every Bible study that they've taught, every sermon they've given, every mission trip they've gone on, every person they've prayed with. And here, like, help me, help me draw these dots and connect these lines here. And so is Phil Lewis, right? Because Phil was a part of influencing me, and I've been a part of influencing others, and Phil has a part to play in every bit of that. Uh, There's a great quote I love by Carl Sagan. He says, in order to uh, bake an apple pie, first you have to create the entire universe. Well, in order for me to teach a young child about communion, there had to be people like Phil Lewis in my life who planted those seeds in me. Okay, you with me? And in this way, I think this is what Paul is pointing us to. Phil's offering his offering of his time, his offering of his talents, and he paid for that pizza a few times, and the offering of his money, they have overflowed into many, and I might say countless, thanksgivings to God. Uh, But wait, there's another element to all of this. So when Phil helped to lead the youth group at Central United Methodist Church in Linwood, New Jersey, uh, we would meet at the church. Uh, When we met there, the lights were always on, there was food to eat, there were Bibles out, there were sofas to sit on. Uh, One time, the church paid for me to go to a leadership training at Easton College in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, I mean, who knew that I would grow up one day to be a Christian leader? I certainly didn't at that time, but the church invested in me. I remember uh, Tony Campolo was one of the speakers at that event. Uh, His love for Jesus was also contagious, and it inspired me and my love for Jesus. But in order for all that to happen, in order for me to take that, you know, to participate in youth group, in order for me to get on that church van and drive to Easton College and hear Tony Campolo, somebody, and really it was a bunch of somebodies, had to put money in the offering plate on Sunday morning. And all of those unnamed people who contributed to the offerings at that church helped me to know and to fall in love with Jesus. And so all of those people also have a part to play in the ministry that I do today, in the ministry of the people that I have helped to enter into ministry. Do you get the idea? I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Where does it start where does this interconnectedness begin, where, and where does it end? And I think that this is what Paul is telling the Corinthian church. He's like, look, we need to take an offering, and we need to get your money to Jerusalem, because then you will have a connection with all the things that God is doing through the church in Jerusalem. Uh, you will have a part uh, in supporting Every single life that's touched by their ministry, every single person, every soul that's won to Christ, your gifts will overflow in thanksgiving to God. Overflow with it. You following me? And uh, Paul says this, I think, uh, plainly in verse 13. He says this, 
You glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. And so you can kind of, you know, again, see these tendrils, uh, you know, kind of like dropping a pebble in a, in a, in a, a pond of water and watching those ripples go out. Paul's saying, do you, do you see it? Do you see it? So I think a lot of times when uh, we come time for the offering in church, uh, maybe it seems a little mundane, you know. It's kind of like paying a car note or paying the rent or something. Ho-hum, you know, here we go with the offering plate. Uh, and talk of money can often seem so worldly. You know, pe- people want to say, oh, well, let's, let's not talk about money in the church or, or, or get off my back, preacher, about it, right? But when we th- take a moment and we really think about the countless lives uh, that are touched by God's love because of our giving, or take a moment and think about how your life has been touched because somebody else gave. Well, Paul says it best. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. So each week we've been hearing witnesses from different members of our church, and today you're going to hear a witness from uh, uh, Becca Bowers. Many of you here at this church will know her as Becca Wharton. Uh, she grew up at First United Methodist Church, uh, participated in our, in our youth group, and you're going to hear uh, uh, from Becca about how these, these things influenced her. She was commissioned recently as a deacon in the Louisiana or in the United Methodist Church uh, uh, last, last year. And so uh, take a moment and, and hear this wonderful testimony from Becca. My name is Becca Bowers, and I grew up at First United Methodist Church. I grew up in the children's ministry and then leading into middle school and high school. When I was in confirmation, um, it was Reverend Jan Holloway, now Reverend Jan Kerwick, who was the spiritual leader of our confirmation class. And I remember she used to tell me that, you know, I was really good at prayers and that one day I was going to be a pastor, which I was in sixth grade. I didn't really, uh, part of me, I think, really didn't like somebody telling me what I was going to do with my life. Gradually, I started to pray a little bit more, practice it at home, um, and you know, working my way through the uh, process of really deciding if I wanted to do something within the church, I started interning with the youth group. I started working with the middle schoolers and high schoolers, which was so much fun. But that's whenever we also had the brand new building. So First United Methodist had raised a ton of money to build this whole new building that I got a chance to be a part of. And from there, that's when we also started Revive 225. So for Revive 225, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you know what that mission is. For me, it led me to the job that I do right now. It was a very simple Google search that found, um, that led me towards counseling. And with that, I can still remember being in one of the stairwells at First United Methodist Church, um, talking to Cherry Johnson about what it would take to marry the mind, the body, and the spirit. And she told me some, you know, programs have uh, counseling with a seminary degree. And that's where I really dove deep into what it would take to be a counselor and a pastor. So now I sit before you all as a provisional uh, professional counselor and a provisional deacon because of all of these big um, you know, threads that First United Methodist was a part of in my life. So along with myself growing in the church, so did my whole entire family. If it wouldn't have been for you all who prayed for me, if it wouldn't have been for you who prayed for my parents, if it wouldn't have been for you who gave to First Shine Methodist um, financial support, billing campaigns, if it wouldn't have been for you who gave the small amount that you could or the large amount that you could to the youth group, 
I would not be doing what I'm doing today. I wouldn't be working with teens still. I wouldn't be uh, supporting them in um, spiritual and mental and emotional health. I wouldn't be the person I am, but neither would my parents, neither would my brother, neither would all the other people that they have affected. And I imagine that as you have given, so have others given back to you. So the process is this big, huge, beautiful circle that is never going to be broken, but it can only grow the more that we grow and the more that we share and the more that we give. So thank you. So do you see the connections? Do you see the way that uh, your giving, your time, your talents, and your money uh, have, have an impact in other people's lives that go on to bless others and so on and so on? Do you see the ripples? And do you understand why Paul talks about this overflowing thanksgiving and this abundant joy? So I want to encourage you today, and really I want to encourage you always, give generously knowing that living generously is a fulfillment of all that God has called you to be. Give willingly, knowing that your gifts supply the needs of God's people and God's work. And give joyfully, knowing that your offering will overflow in many thanksgivings to God. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin, and all who seek to live in peace with one another. Now let us confess our sin before God and each other. O oh God, source of all that makes life possible, giver of all that makes life good, we gather to give you our thanks. Yet we confess that we have often failed to live our thankfulness. What we have, we take for granted and we grumble about what we lack. We have squandered your bounty with little thought of those who will come after us. We are more troubled by the few who have more than by the many who have less. Forgive us, O oh God. In this hour of worship, accept our thanksgiving and teach us to make gratitude and sharing our way of life. The Lord is merciful and gracious, endlessly patient, loving, and true. The Lord shows mercy to thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin and granting pardon. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Well, now that we've confessed and received pardon from God, part of preparing ourselves for the Lord's table is to share the peace of Christ and to reconcile with one another. And so I want to invite you now to share the peace of Christ with those who might be worshiping with you at home or wherever you may be, and also extend that invitation uh, to people, be it uh, text message, social media, however you want to do that. Peace be with you. So uh, even though we are separated by distance and time, I do want to continue to uh, ask you to interact with us in a variety of ways. So there are, uh, all of these links will be available wherever you may be worshiping. There's one that's a connection card that is just a way that you can let us know that you're worshiping. Uh, Give us your name, email address. Uh, Even if we already have that information, just uh, take a moment and do that and let us know you're worshiping today. And if... uh, If you're worshiping with us for the first time or visiting, I do want to offer you a special welcome, and I trust that you'll be blessed by this time, and that's my hope and prayer for you. Uh, You'll also see options there to fill out a prayer request and opportunities to give a gift to the church. You can do that via text message. You can go to the church's website, and you can mail a gift to the address that's on your screen. Uh, So I do want to point out uh, some uh, uh, signs of our shared life together as a congregation The flowers today are given to the glory of God and in honor of Judy Power's birthday by her family. So happy birthday to Judy. And the roses honor uh, the births of Aubrey Renee and Caleb Isaac, the children of Adam and Angela Campbell and grandchildren of Lynn and Patty Pierce. And also Luke Trotter, the child of Robert and Morgan Johnson and the grandchild of Fred and Tricia Johnson. So we give thanks to God for those new lives. Uh, So we're wrapping up our annual generosity emphasis this week. Uh, Our theme has been, In God We Trust. And that's been my hope and my prayer through this time, is that we have grown in our trust in God and in our understanding of why the practice of generosity is, is a sign of and a practice of trusting God. And so today, as an act of worship, we are asking the friends and members of First United Methodist Church to complete an estimate of giving card. And what this card uh, does is it, it kind of uh, it, 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 uh, puts your plan in place for how you're planning to give uh, this year. And uh, you can submit those cards in a variety of ways. Uh, you can go to our church's website and complete a card there. Uh, You can also, uh, there'll be a link available on whatever platform you're worshiping on. You can click there. And we also are having a drive-through time from 12 to noon, and that would be uh, today, Sunday, February the 7th, um, and that'll be behind the adult building at the church. If you want to come and actually bring your card to the church, uh, I'll be there, and I'd I'd love to see you and and, uh, collect those. Um, And you can always uh, send a card via the mail as as well. But we're going to do that in just a few moments as an act of worship. So I want to begin to get you, uh, for you to prepare yourself about that. And what I want to ask you to do is think about one of three things. Uh, First of all, do you have a giving plan? Is giving something that you plan to do? Is the practice of generosity something that you think ahead to do? Uh, And if not, I want to encourage you to do that. And filling out an estimate of giving card is one way you can do that. Uh, Second of all, are you a proportional giver? So last week I talked about this uh, percentage of giving chart. Uh, And this this is just a good way to plan your giving and to really kind of give in this biblical sense of first fruits giving, proportional giving, or a tithe. And so where are you in this chart? Do you give it 3%, 4%? Where are you? Uh, And I want to challenge you to ask yourself maybe what God is calling you to do next. And similarly, if you're a tither... Uh, and you're giving it 10%, uh, I want to thank you for your faithfulness, but I also want to remind you that everything you have belongs to God, and to also pray about what, God, what else God might be calling you to do as an act of trust and generosity. So again, we're going to collect uh, those cards, or you're going to submit that information in just a little while as an act of worship, uh, and uh, just want you to be in prayer and to begin to think about uh, that gift and your offering. But at this time, I invite you to join me in prayer as we ask God's blessing over today's offering. Let us pray. Loving God, you are always with us, and you give us all that we need to be your church. Help us to trust you, and help us also to give as we have received abundantly, generously, joyfully, that our offering may overflow in thanksgiving to you. Lord, bless this offering and all that it allows us to do as your people. 
And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And at this time, as we continue to prepare our hearts to make our commitments before God, I invite you to join me in a litany, and you'll find the words on your screen. When the deceitfulness of wealth makes us long for more, God of abundance in you, we place our trust. When we hold back our gifts full of fear for tomorrow, God of abundance in you, we place our trust. When worry sets in and we fail to turn to you, God of abundance, in you we place our trust. When we're tempted to love more money more than we love you, God of abundance, in you we place our trust. God of abundance, teach us that wealth always falls short, but your gifts always abound. God of abundance, teach us that fear is a never-ending lie, but you are the stronghold of our life. God of abundance, teach us that we will never gather enough, but you offer us more than we need. God of abundance, teach us this day to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but as cheerful givers. Amen. And at this time, as you enjoy this musical meditation, I want to encourage you, go to those links and and, and fill out that information and make your commitment to God and to the church.
And I want to offer you thanks for your faithfulness, for your generosity, and for placing your trust in God. But let's ask God's blessing over these commitments that we've all made today. Let us pray. O God, most merciful and gracious, of whose bounty we have all received, accept these offerings as a sign of our trust in you. Remember in your love those who have brought these gifts and those for whom it is given. And Lord, help us uh, to promote your peace and your goodwill among all people to advance the kingdom of you, our Lord and Savior. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to invite you to join in the great thanksgiving as we share in spiritual communion together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, He gave thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now will you join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to join me in the prayer for spiritual communion. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I believe you are spiritually present in the sacrament of Holy Communion. I love you above all things and hunger to be drawn nearer to you through your body which was broken for me. In this time of isolation, confusion, fear, loss, and loneliness, when your church cannot gather physically at your table, I long for your presence. I ask you now to come spiritually into my heart. I welcome and embrace you. I unite myself to you and to the church past, present, and future. Let nothing ever separate me from you or you from me. 
Amen. And let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you make yourself available to us. And Lord, having received your presence into our hearts and into our lives, we ask that you would go with us from this time. And Lord, touch everyone that we meet. Use us, Lord, uh, as your children, as your servants in this world. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So one of the great gifts that we have been given as Christians is the gift of the church, uh, the gift of, of Christian community. Uh, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, uh, told us that uh, you know, Christianity is a team sport. He said Christian, there's no such thing as a solitary Christian. We need one another. And so I always, uh, it's a privilege to invite you to consider uh, making First United Methodist Church of Baton Rouge your church community, your church home. Uh, we do ask that those who would join our church confess Christ as their Lord and their Savior, and that they would make commitments to this community uh, to live out that faith as, as part of this, this uh, covenant. And so uh, we have a gathering that we call Believe and Belong, and we talk about what it means to have faith in Christ and what it means to be a committed part of a community of faith. So if you're looking for a church home and you'd like to become a member of First United Methodist Church, uh, I invite you to the next com upcoming Believe and Belongs. Uh, the dates are February the 28th and March the 2nd. You can email Karen Milioto, and uh, she'd be happy to just sign you up and, and let us know you're coming or answer any questions that you might have. And now I want to invite you to join in our closing hymn.
I want to thank you for joining us for worship, and what a wonderful time of worship we've had. I hope that uh, you've been blessed, that you've been reminded of, of God's presence in your life, and that you have once again heard God's guiding voice uh, for you and for what God has prepared for you. Go now, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.